Okay, so so we are live. Uh, I see Jose uh, back back on screen. So hello everyone and and welcome to today's uh, event in the in the ISTVS digital event series. Uh, I'm Massimo Martelli. I'm a researcher at the National Research Council of Italy, and I'm also the general secretary uh, of ISTVS. Uh, today, uh, this is our first installment in this series after the ISTVS online conference, which, as you probably already know, uh, took place uh, last month. And today, uh, we have a Terra Mechanics Byte uh, on uh, data-driven models uh, for Terra Mechanics simulations. And our, speak our speaker is Dr. Jose Andrade, uh, from the California Institute of Technology. Uh, just uh, a quick request uh, before we start for our audience. Uh, in the sidebar uh, on the right-hand side of the screen, look for sessions. And under session, look for the chat tab. And please uh, drop in a short intro of your location affiliation and, and your research interest, just to uh, make it easier for us to establish a connection with you. And you'll also see there a tab called Q&A, uh, where you can type questions for our speaker. Uh, after the presentation, we will also have an open conversation, and we will ask you to click uh, the blue button at the top right to share your audio and video and join uh, the live conversation, uh, and a, a moderator uh, will admit you uh, to the session. Of course, if you are not inclined to join live, you can still type uh, questions in the Q and A tab, and we will uh, we will relate them to uh, to our speaker. So uh, now, uh, please allow me just uh, a, a few more uh, seconds to uh, properly introduce our speaker. So uh, Dr. Andrade is a civil engineer and the George W. Hausner Professor of Civil and Mechanical Engineering at the California Institute of Technology. He is a world leader in developing computer models to simulate the physics of complex systems. And he has written hundreds of papers and holds patents on the level set discrete element method a computer modeling tool that can simulate the dynamical response of multi-body systems. He has more than 20 years of experience in the high-tech space with projects ranging from energy to defense to planetary science. And his work has been recognized with numerous honors and awards worldwide. Uh, Dr. Andrade got his bachelor's degree in civil engineering summa cum laude from the Florida Institute of Technology and his Master of Science and PhD uh, from Stanford University. So now uh, that's really it for my intro and Jose, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Massimo, thank you for the invitation. Can you hear me well? Yes, yes we can. Okay. Terrific, okay. Well, it's a great honor and pleasure for me to be here. Uh, through the magic of the internet. Um, and I am pleased that uh, you could join us today. And my presentation uh, today is going to be uh, motivated by Terra Mechanics applications, but what I'm going to show you is more general than Terra Mechanics. But uh, I will use Terra Mechanics as a, as a motivator uh, for the kind of data-driven models that I'm about to show you. And before I begin, I want to acknowledge my, my collaborators, my co-authors, uh, in particular, Costas Calipipetis, uh, my former PhD student, who is now a uh, Marie Curie fellow uh, at ETH uh, doing his postdoc uh, there. And I also want to acknowledge uh, Michael Ortiz, uh, who's a professor here at Caltech, um, and also Laurence Denier, who is a professor in uh, Nantes, uh, France. And so this is a collaborative work with them, and I'm excited uh, to 
present this work to you uh, here in this forum. So let's get started. Uh, let me first uh, show you a video here on the on the left. You see a vehicle um, that clearly is having some challenges with the terrain. Uh, mobility poses a great challenge uh, for mechanics. The one of the biggest questions that we have in mobility, as you uh, know, is the development the development of these go no go maps. Right? The the ability to predict, if you will, whether a a vehicle like this one uh, you see here in the video can actually go through that terrain. So, for instance, you see that this this uh, this vehicle is, is stuck here. So this would be a no go uh, situation for this vehicle. But in general. If you're in the field, uh, of course, you want to make all or most of your terrain uh, go area so that terrain is not an obstacle to you. And the way that people try to figure out whether things are go or no go, whether a terrain is go or no, no go, is, is by mostly using two types of approaches. The, the first uh, type is uh, usually called simple geomechanics. Um, where you have very crude, uh, you know, modeling uh, techniques uh, that are fast, but they're not extremely uh, accurate. This was the beginning of terra mechanics, if you will, uh, with the Becker one type models, and, and that has been very successful. It, it even influenced the development of models for uh, rovers uh, that are now exploring the surface of Mars, and then. In the last, say, 20 years, uh, this so-called complex thermal mechanics uh, have been developed uh, so that you can predict better the interaction between the wheel and, and the terrain. Here you see on the top uh, a, a video of, uh, of a shear band developing under the wheel, uh, and people have developed computational methods, mostly finite elements, MPM recently, uh, to simulate this interaction. And, and what I want to highlight is the development of this intense zone of deformation right under the wheel, which we typically call a discontinuity or, or a shear band. And I want to ha highlight that when a shear band develops, as I will show you later, uh, the problem becomes non-local and um, traditional local finite element models or any local models uh, like MPM will uh, have significant challenges and inaccuracies uh, once this has developed. So non-locality dominates uh, and unfortunately is not yet considered in most of the current continuum models that we have available uh, to us today. So I just want to start the, the conversation with, with this major challenge that is mostly ignored and it's central to the issue of mobility and terra mechanics, uh, especially in complex uh, geomechanics. And so we're going to take inspiration from uh, one of my favorite authors, Nathaniel uh, Hawthorne, who um, said in the scarlet letter, uh, who can see an inch into futurity beyond his own nose? And, and this is very much applicable to uh, the idea of making predictions, right? Uh, usually making predictions is very difficult, especially about the future. And I think this quote by, by Hawthorne uh, really uh, captures that. And, and this is really the challenge of predicting outside of a data set or doing extra, extrapolation. Most models are predicting the past and even then they're not doing it so well. So just think about that and that's going to provide the motivation for what we're going to be doing uh, here today. So here's the outline of my talk. I'll um, start by giving you a brief uh, introduction further of what I've uh, shown you already. And then I'll go into uh, discrete models uh, that are uh, the so-called physics-based uh, models. And then I'm gonna show you how we can integrate these physics-based models into this data-driven paradigm uh, that is very new and uh, you probably haven't heard of, 
but hopefully today, after today, you'll understand. see a, a beautiful uh, image of a sample that has been compressed triaxially and has developed this, this very uh, intense zone of deformation that we call shear band, and that's a classic example of a length scale being introduced in a problem because we know very well that this shear band has a characteristic thickness of about 10 to 20 uh, particle uh, diameters, and so that length scale uh, speaks of the existence of a non-local behavior. And you can see that non-local behavior also um, manifested in this uh, stress strain curve. You see here there is a, a, a finite element solution using a local model. And post bifurcation, post localization, you see that the model displays what's called a pathological mesh dependence. So your solution. Uh, becomes, and as you refine the mesh, the thickness and also uh, decreases. And if you continue to refine the mesh to essentially zero uh, element uh, size, the thickness of your shear band will also approach uh, zero thickness. So this is a, a massive problem uh, for non-local, rather for local uh, models. And it's still very much unresolved. The way that people try to deal with that is by um, introducing local, uh, or rather non-local uh, models, as I will describe later. Here on the right, let's see if this video plays. Uh, we have a, a, an image of an of a of a uh, an experiment uh, showing a hopper uh, flow, and as you can see, those colored particles. Uh, on the screen eventually meet together at the opening of the hopper and they form a bridge that uh, jams the system and uh, prevents flow from continuing. And so on the bottom here, you see on the bottom right, you see this beautiful uh, power law, this, this relationship that relates uh, the flow of the hopper with the opening of the of the hopper relative to the grain uh, size, uh, and so again there is a length scale here uh, that is related to the opening of the of the hopper, and you know relative to the size of the particles. So you can imagine that if you have uh, smaller particles for a fixed hopper uh, opening, this will be able to flow easier and also shape uh, matters, by the way. But anyway, a, a local model is unable to uh, predict this jamming transition because a local model has no length scale again. And yet here in this experiment from Behringer, you see that there is a clear length scale that things jam at a certain opening uh, relative to the grain size diameter. And so, the hopper jamming is another case of non-local uh, models not being able to capture the behavior that we clearly see uh, displayed. And so this has motivated the development of non-local models. Uh, unfortunately, as I will show you later, these models, these non-local models are ad hoc. They need to define a priori this length scale that we're going to call L. Um, and that has to be a design parameter that you have to introduce into the model uh, a priori. And that, that is a major uh, you know, drawback of these models. So people have tried to tackle problems in complex geomechanics you know, uh, as of today, mostly in three parts. So you have the plasticity models. This captures the local and non-local models. Um, the issue here is that, you know, there is a lot of calibration necessary, as I will show you, the introduction of these ad hoc parameters. 
So plasticity has been successful, but it's reached uh, somewhat uh, a glass ceiling. Um, in the recent years, in the last 10 years or so, people are doing a lot of multi-scale, uh, especially uh, FEM, DEM type uh, models where you go to the lower scale to perform a grain scale calculation and then bring that result back to the continuum. This is okay, uh, but it's uh, very expensive. You cannot reuse the data in general. And so uh, it, it has its limitations, uh, but it's, it's, you know, it's fairly powerful. And then recently, maybe in the last five years or so, there is this huge advent of uh, machine learning. And I'm going to claim uh, here today that, that this is pretty glorified, uh, you know, uh, fitting. And most of these approaches are, are black box. You, you don't really know what the machine is doing. Um, and so, we want to avoid these uh, hidden representations uh, that are underlying uh, machine learning. So what I'm going to show you today is a data-driven approach that is very different from machine learning, as you will see. But before I do that, let me just remind you of how most uh, constitutive models, how more, most plasticity models work, right? They're all predicated on this uh, beautiful idea by, by Moore Coulomb uh, that, uh, you know, that essentially says that the shear strength in a granular material in the soil um, proportional, right, to the compressive uh, stress sigma uh, via some mobilized friction angle mu. Uh, so shear is proportional to pressure, and the proportionality constant is given by the friction coefficient. Um, and this also gives you a sense for where the failure um, surface is going to be and how it's going to be oriented. So this has been very successful. And this has been the cornerstone for constitutive modeling. And I, I just want to show you an example of a constitutive model um, that I worked on during my, my PhD. Uh, this is the North Sand uh, constitutive model. It's a plasticity model, very successful. You can see that you can, it can capture the behavior of dense and loose sand under, this is triaxial compression on the left. Um, and then on the right here, on this right column, you see, uh, predictions on the plane strain. And you calibrate the model for about 12 uh, parameters. And then with those 12 parameters, you're able to replicate the calibration uh, experiment, say under triaxial compression. And then you make a prediction with a fixed set of parameters under uh, plane strain. So this is a fairly successful model. Um, it can reproduce the microscopic uh, uh, behavior, you know, the stress strain uh, curves that we see in experiments, as you can uh, see here, but it requires a large number of parameters to be calibrated. And most of the time, even myself as a, as a you know, as a, as a very close user of this uh, model, you don't know what these parameters mean. For example, there is this hardening constant here, H that is extremely difficult to calibrate and extremely difficult to justify physically. It's, it's hard to define what it means. And so we want to escape this uh, issue of phenomenology and having, you know, a dozen parameters. There are some constitutive models that have up to 24 uh, parameters, uh, right? And so it becomes extremely unwidely to calibrate uh, those. So we want to understand the material behavior and we want to be able to introduce non-locality. By the way, this is a local model. So this model has this issue of mesh dependence and it cannot capture uh, you know, the thickness of shear bands and that jamming transition that you saw in the hopper. So that motivates the development of more physics-based models that can do better and go deeper into the physics. So let's, let's look into those. Uh, so the question is, can we do better? And the answer is yes. Uh, we can use uh, physics-based models to predict behavior. Uh, and so let me show you what those can do first, and then we'll go to data-driven approaches. So the idea that I want to uh, implant in your mind is that uh, these models that you see here uh, in this uh, cube here on the right, uh, you can see them as virtual experiments. Um, so we have the ability, as you see here in this uh, movie, to pluviate the sample. Uh, in this case, we're pluviating a cube. Uh, and then using this sample uh, and basic physics, 
you know, contact mechanics, F equals MA, those kind of basic physics, we are able to replicate the behavior of granular materials at the grain level. And from that interaction of the grains, we are able to obtain the constitutive response, just like you would do in a real experiment. And today I don't have time to show you uh, res uh, results, but we have shown that these virtual experiments can capture perfectly uh, the real physical experiments. And they have a massive advantage over physical experiments. These virtual experiments are reproducible, they're controllable, and they're scalable. Real physical experiments, for example, cannot be perfectly reproducible, as you know, because you can never make quite the same uh, sample. Whereas here, you can always have an identical sample control perfectly the boundary conditions and then scale up and down as needed. Um, and then use that to, again, to obtain the constitutive response. But go and look into our papers and look at the comparisons between the virtual experiments and the physical experiments and you, you will see that these models are, these virtual experiments are really reproducing reality. So this is really a, a, a major tool at our disposal now. And we can prepare then identical and controlled samples and probe. So here's an example of the kind of uh, triaxial axial test that we can do. And we can take the sample along different stress paths, right? So we can go from zero stress all the way to a, a pre-consolidation stress A. And then we can shear the sample to a, to a consolidation state B then go all the way to C and then maybe unload to get a, a, a state B prime. And for instance, we can compare the different responses between B and B prime, right? The, we can look at the effect of pre-consolidation and pre-shearing uh, using this probing technique that experimentalists use. So we can reproduce everything that you can do in the lab and even better. And we can investigate elasticity, yielding, plastic flow, uh, the evolution state of the, of the granular material and the effect of morphology or particle shape. Uh, and so here are some examples of, of this kind of work. So this is what experimentalists call the rendulic plane. So what they do is they prepare a sample, like the one you see here, and then they maybe pre-consolidate it to some uh, state like I showed you B or B prime. And then what they do is they probe uh, with this incremental stress they essentially probe in a circle of constant diameter, right? And with that probe, for every single one of these delta uh, sigmas, you obtain a corresponding de delta epsilon. So you, you probe with an incremental stress, and then you read off or you obtain an incremental strain. And when you put these two together, this is the cornerstone of your constitutive response. And this is what people call the, the rendulic plane when you look at things on, on these uh, planes. So here's an example, right, of, of again, state B, that pre-consolidated state B. And what happens is we probe around uh, that state B, and you can see here the incremental strain response. And this point corresponds, for instance, to uh, extension. And this point over here corresponds to compression, and you can see that there is a massive difference between extension and compression. The blue, the, the black line represents the total strains. The red lines represent the plastic uh, strains. So, and the, and the green is the elasticity, the elastic response. So you can see, for instance, that the plastic response under compression is totally different from the plastic response under extension. In fact, when, when you're doing extension, there's essentially zero uh, plastic response. Whereas in compression, you have this massive plastic response. Um, so you can use this kind of insight to then reconstruct plasticity models like the one you see here on the screen. Uh, again, using a local model or a non-local model, you can even discover the lack of normality or the lack of associativity in the flow rule, and um, you know, construct plasticity models that can go beyond just uh, stress-strain response. For instance, here is, is an example of the fabric evolution. So how does the fabric look 
like in these different points in the behavior. Again, here's the extension point, here's the compression point. So if you look at the extension point, you see that the strong uh, contact network, for instance, is gaining uh, contacts in the horizontal direction. Uh, that's the green, uh, that's gain, uh, gains in contact, whereas they're losing contacts in the vertical direction. And you see the opposite when you look at the weak uh, contact network. The weak contact network gains uh, contacts in the vertical direction. It loses some contacts in the horizontal direction. And then when you look at the compressive point, the, uh, the tendencies uh, flipped over, right, for the, for the strong network and for the weak network. So the point of this is that you have access to the micromechanics that is simply not available to you in the experiments. And you can use all of this information to construct your, you know, the, the models that you're interested in. In fact, you can even reconstruct yield surfaces. So here are the yield surfaces that we obtain from this probing all over the stress uh, space. And again, you can, you can even reproduce the flow rule and, and show that there is very strong non-associativity, uh, especially in the meridian plane, as you see here. But we're not going to dwell on, on, on constitutive models because that's not what we're interested in today. But I'm just showing you that if you're interested in constitutive models, you can obtain them back this micromechanics based uh, virtual experiments that are extremely powerful and very reliable. Uh, but what we're going to do here today is something slightly different. We can, we can go from this grain scale mechanics or what we call the, the, the dynamic network attributes or DNA of the material. Um, so you can have the shape and the and the morphology, uh, grain size distribution, mineralogy of uh, material then you combine that with a particular state, right? Some uh, degree of uh, compaction or relative density. Uh, and when you probe then that DNA at a certain state of a material with some boundary conditions, right? With some shearing, for example, you obtain a certain uh, constitutive behavior. Uh, and we are interested in that behavior. And what we're going to do is uh, given the postulate that this DNA exists, we are going to obtain this microscopic behavior by probing the grain scale on demand. So I'm going to be using these virtual experiments on the fly uh, to obtain the microscopic response on an as needed basis. And then I can keep that response and tabulate it if I want, or I can you know, continue to populate uh, the phase space as, as needed. So we're gonna use the physics-based virtual experiments to generate data for a data-driven approach. So that takes us to the last part of the talk and the main part of the talk, which is this data-driven model. So what is this data-driven modeling all about? Um, so let me show you some, ex some equations. Don't, don't be afraid, uh, don't be scared by the, by the equations. They're, they're, they're simpler than they look. So, let me walk you through them. When you're solving a classical problem, like that problem I showed you early on of the wheel on top of the, of the granular material, you're always solving several equations. The first one you're solving is the balance of linear momentum. That's equation number one uh, here in the classical approach. Then you are always imposing some constraints. For instance, you're, you're imposing the constraint that uh, you know you have to have compatibility. So this defines your strains uh, as the gradient of your dis uh, of your displacements u. So you can say that your physics are encapsulated in equations one and two, plus the boundary conditions, of course, that you are imposing on your problem. And then you introduce what's called a closure relationship, a relation between the stress and the strain, which we call constitutive equation. Right? And so here's a, a schematic of what you're doing. You're solving the, uh, the, the uh, governing equation plus the, the constraint, right? And you are imposing a constitutive response and that allows you to, so to solve and find a unique solution. Instead of doing that, we're going to be doing data-driven here on the right. And here's the idea. So imagine you have a phase space Z, 
that is defined by pairs of uh, strains and stresses. Uh, epsilon is the strain again, and sigma is the stress. So these are all the possible strain and stress pairs that you can have. Then define something that's called an equilibrium set, E. This equilibrium set is nothing but those points in the, in the phase space that satisfy equations one and two. So that's the balance of linear momentum and the, and the compatibility uh, condition, okay, your constraint. So essentially, the equilibrium set are those points in phase uh, space that comply with the laws of physics, if you will. Then you define a material set D that also uh, is a subset of a phase space, but that's your data, okay? That maybe you obtain that data from uh, experiments or maybe from virtual experiments as I showed you earlier. And what you do then, your problem becomes finding the intersection or the minimum distance between your equilibrium set E and your data. In other words, you're looking for solutions that satisfy your um, uh, laws of physics on the one hand, and at the same time, um, honor the data, right? So they comply with the data. So here is a schematic again of what that looks like. The blue line here is my equilibrium set and I'm looking for points in red that are closest to that equilibrium set. So those red points are my data points. They are also obeying the laws of physics. So this is the concept of data-driven. Notice that there is no conservative equation in the data-driven approach. Now, the challenge is that when you have granite or materials, two main uh, problems come up, right, that are not present in linear elasticity, which is simple enough uh, for data-driven. Um, so in, in nonlinear elastoplastic processes, we need to uh, tackle two major challenges. One is the challenge of data availability. You don't have enough data usually. You have a few experiments, for instance, right? So you have data sparsity. And the other problem you have is that you need to be able to tell in a general simulation what is forward, what is backward, what is present. So you need to be able to tell what's, you know, what's the past, what's the present, and what's the future, or in other words, the time history um, nature of the response, which we usually tackle in, in constitutive modeling with, with the introduction of some uh, history dependent parameter, right, or plastic internal variable. So let's see how we tackle these challenges. So the first one, uh, the most straightforward way to uh, deal with uh, data sparsity is to be able to conduct experiments on the fly. And that's, that's what I'm going to be doing in this talk. But you can do more, you know, um, elegant solutions. But today here, we're, we're just going to do the brute force approach, which is anywhere Anytime you need data, you just conduct a virtual experiment and you generate that data on the fly, okay? And we do it because it's, it's convenient and we have these virtual experiments uh, that I showed you before. So not the most efficient, but perhaps the most robust approach. And um, with the physics-based models that we have at our disposal, this makes uh, complete sense. But you can do a lot of other things, like even the use of machine learning here when you're trying to uh, interpolate uh, data. Uh, the second challenge is more uh, intellectually uh, challenging, which is how do you define the past, the present, and the future in data sets that are all intermingled, as I will show you examples. Uh, so you need to introduce the notion of time history. Um, and there are two approaches that you can uh, take here, at least. One is the general thermodynamics approach, where you have the, um, the dissipation inequality, uh, D, right, that we know from continuum mechanics has to be greater than or equal to zero. And what we do then is we expand the uh, dissipation inequality. And so you see here the epsilon k plus one, sigma k plus one candidate pair. Here you have the previous pair, epsilon k, sigma k. And what you do is that you do not accept a candidate pair, epsilon k plus one, sigma k plus one, 
unless they satisfy the dissipation inequality. Okay, so if they do, you take it, you take it as a valid point. If they don't uh, satisfy the dissipation inequality, you throw it away. So in the schematic, what that means is that if you're at a given point here, here's your current state in a, in a stress strain uh, curve. The allowable points would be the ones on black, for, for instance, if you're increasing epsilon, right? So those would be your loading uh, points. And then the allowable points will also be the green ones if you're decreasing in strain. Those would be your unloading uh, set of points, right? But for instance, the red points would be inadmissible uh, stress points, right, uh, for, for, your, for your data set. Uh, you can also think of another flavor, which is to introduce an internal variable, uh, but we won't be discussing that uh, today. And, and this is sort of a throwback uh, to plasticity. Very, we, we've shown that they're, they're very similar approaches to the ones we have in plasticity models, but we, we won't be uh, discussing those today. Uh, we'll do the thermodynamics approach, and with the thermodynamics approach, all I want to say right now is that all the data that you have, the stress, the strain, the energies, the dissipation, all of it, you can see here, is being upscaled or homogenized from the grain scale mechanics or from the micromechanics using very simple upscaling like the one you see here. Uh, and so you can see what each of these quantities mean. For instance, here's a strain, which is the particle displacements U P and then like normal. Um, the stress, right, it's given by the so-called Christofferson equation. It takes the interparticle contact force, force Fc, uh, and it multiplies it with the branch factor, and so on and so forth. So everything is coming from the micro scale. And the same applies to the internal variable approach. Again, we won't discuss it uh, too much, but, but, but I want to tell you that at the end of the day, this becomes a function of the so-called anisotropy uh, tensors. Here's the structural anisotropy, the force anisotropy, uh, and we have shown that this works extremely well for granular materials. So let me show you some examples, again, to, to bring this home, right, this, this whole concept. So imagine you do a bunch of tests. So we're going to do a biaxial compression uh, set of tests, isotropic compression set of tests, and simple shear uh, tests. And each one of these colored curves is a data set that results from this test. So we have a bunch of data sets from the biaxial compression, a bunch of tests from isotropic compression, and a bunch of tests from simple shear. So this provides us with data. This is going to be our data. And we generate this data with the virtual experiments that I showed you before. So here's the data, again, in, in these curves that have color. And what we're going to do to test the data-driven approach, just to show you an example, is we're going to do a different experiment. So we're going to conduct a different boundary value problem that is not uh, simply described by one of these data sets that we obtained uh, from the virtual experiments, but actually, in reality, it cuts across several of the data sets. So here, I know it's hard to see, but in black, you see the, the line cutting across, right? This stress path cutting across the data and then unloading. Uh, and, and that's the direct numerical simulation using the physics-based model that's shown in, um, in the solid squares. Opposed to that is the data-driven response. And you can see that you have to really squint and look closely because the data-driven response, which is just, again, coming directly from these data sets, it's right on top of the physics-based uh, response or the validation uh, response, right? And, and you can also see that they cut across at least one, two, three, four, maybe even five data sets. Um, and also, the unloading is quite interesting. It cuts across different data sets and different data points that, again, are being furnished by the dissipation inequality. So we, we can't get into the details because we don't have time, but, but with this example, I'm trying to show you the power, the ability of the data-driven approach to replicate the data 
and to predict new experiments that were not explicitly uh, you know, accounted for in the data, but are implicitly accounted for in the data. And now let me take you finally to the non-local uh, part of the talk, uh, because everything I've, I've shown you uh, so far is essentially local. Uh, so the ultimate goal of, of this talk and, and, and the work we've done is to tackle non-locality. And, and in particular, we are very interested in this length scale that appears in these uh, shear bands that form in experiments, but also in, in grain scale calculations. Uh, I told you this is, this is a major problem in geomechanics and granular physics. Uh, and people have been looking for this characteristic length scale for decades, uh, literally, uh, to avoid the mesh dependence, but also to capture the thickness of shear bands. Um, and so in order to um, tackle that problem, uh, people have postulated two broad classes of uh, constitutive models. One is called the weekly nonlinear, the weekly non-local theories. Um, so there are many examples of these. It considers locally non-affine deformation, but at the end of the day, it requires this length scale L, as you see here. Uh, and then there is the flavor of the strongly non-local theories. Uh, you see here a characteristic example of that. Uh, but again, there is an introduction of the same length scale parameter L. So weakly non-local and strongly non-local approaches, and here are some papers, examples of those approaches, they all require the uh, introduction, but also the prescription of this length scale L. You as the user, you have to provide a model with that length scale L, okay? And you usually do it by calibration. So what people do is they come to this shear band problem, they tune the length scale L, and after they tune it, they're able to capture this thickness of a shear band, okay? So it's an ad hoc post-mortem approach. You cannot Predict, you cannot ask these people to predict the thickness of a shear band, for instance, before they calibrate L. You have to calibrate L, and then you can predict the shear band. So using data-driven approaches, we can circumvent this massive handicap of having to prescribe L, and rather we will discover L using the data, all the data, and nothing but the data, as I will show you. So, we expand our equations as we had before for the local problem. Now we expand it to account for the micropolar approach. So I'm going to show you first the classic approach and then I'll show you the data driven approach. So the classic micropolar uh, formulation is the one you see here, equations one through four. Again, don't be afraid of the, of the equations. The first one is simply your balance of linear momentum again. The second one now is this uh, new compatibility uh, equation. And, and so you get two compatibility equations that have to do with your strains and your stresses relating to your rotations, the micro rotations and your curvatures mu, okay, your, your uh, micro stresses mu. Um, and so here's your curvature rather, kappa. Uh, that's another constraint. So in the micropolar, you have your governing equations plus your constraints. So the physics, if you will, are equations one through four. And then what you do, just like you do in the local problem, you introduce a closure relationship that allows you to relate the stresses and the micro stresses, so sigma and, and mu, to all of these variables, right, which are your strain, your curvature, and pay attention here to this length scale L. So your constitutive equation becomes a monster that is extremely difficult to capture mathematically, but also you have to calibrate uh, with a lot of pain, and in particular, uh, again, introduce this length scale L. Um, so instead, look at the right here, the data-driven uh, approach, what it does, just like before, it, um, it, it defines a phase space Z now that of course contains more uh, macroscopic quantities than before. So we have your strain and your stress as before, but now you have kappa and mu, right? Your curvatures and your uh, micro stresses mu. And now you introduce an equilibrium set E 
that lives in the phase space, but also complies with your equations, uh, your governing equations and your constraints. So the physics, just like in the local problem, here are your physics. Uh, so your equilibrium set has to obey the physics. And then you define a material set D and you're doing exactly the same thing as you were doing before. Uh, you are finding the intersection or the minimum distance between your, your equilibrium set E and your data D. Again, all we've done here is expanded the formulation or the phase space to include the couple stresses mu and the curvature uh, kappa. But other than that, everything is identical in philosophy to the local uh, problem. And like before, you introduce the uh, history parameterization approach by, by requiring that your dissipation inequality be greater than zero, putting the same constraint as before as to what is loading and what is unloading. And as before, you are upscaling everything from the grain scale, okay? So for example, here's your curvature kappa. It's taking into account the micro rotations uh, uh, theta uh, p at a particle level. So here's theta p defined and uh, your normal uh, vector np and so on. And so everything here emanates from the grain scale. Okay, so all the macroscopic parameters are being calculated, are being measured directly from the grain scale, no constitutive model, no tuning of parameters, everything is emanating from the grain scale. So, let's all right, uh, let's do an experiment uh, to see how well this approach works in the context of the shear bands that I told you uh, about earlier. So on the left here, you see here is a picture of the experiment. And here I'm going to show you the direct numerical simulation. So the physics-based simulation of the actual experiment. Uh, so you're going to see this deforming in a second. And you see the development of a shear band in the, in the grain scale computational model, this level set uh, DDM model. So this is going to be our ground truth. And we know that that's our ground truth because we have compared it with experiments. And again, we've published papers on that and it compares extremely well with the experiments. So it's, 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 it's essentially identical to the experiments, but it has more information, like for instance, the grain scale um, contact forces that is not available in experiments. So we use this data instead. And here on the right, on, on, on this mesh that you see here, we're going to have a finite element mesh that is solving the equations of micropolar continuum, as I showed you before. Okay, so here your degrees of freedom are your displacements u and your micro rotations theta. Okay, and with that, you're going to solve the equations, the governing equations and the constraints, but instead of having um, a constitutive law, in your finite elements, you're going to rely on this data-driven approach that I told you about earlier. And we're going to impose exactly the same boundary conditions, the same confinement. Notice that even the platen on the top of the sample is uh, tilting a little bit because that's what we observed in the experiments. And we are imposing exactly the same boundary condition uh, on, the, on the sample. In fact, I want to emphasize that we're not tilting the platen. The, the platen is tilting uh, normally, or you know, uh, as a, as a response, because the platen is being pushed down, but it has a degree of freedom that allows it to to rotate. So that rotation that you see there is is observed. It's happening naturally uh, in the sample as well as in the in the computation and in the experiment. So how did how do they compare? So let's look at a quant quantitative comparison of the results here. So let me start with the evolution of the volumetric strain versus the axial strain, epsilon A. So in gray, the first curve you see is the experimental data. I like, in all of my work, I like to always bring in the experimental data just to give you a sense for how well or how bad we are comparing with the, with the actual experimental data. So that's in gray. And then in, in blue, uh, you see the uh, direct numerical simulation by LSDEM. 
And again, as I told you earlier, LSDM compares fairly well with the experiments. And then in black and red, you see the response, the volumetric uh, strain response from the finite element data-driven calculation. And we are doing it twice, once for a coarse mesh and once for a fine mesh, just to highlight the fact that there is no mesh sensitivity when you refine the mesh. The two uh, responses are on top of each other. That's why you cannot really differentiate them uh, very much. And then when you plot the stress-strain curve, so here is the sigma one over sigma three versus axial strain uh, response. Again, the experiments are on gray, uh, in gray. Uh, the, the direct numerical simulation, the level set simulation is in blue. And then your micropolar finite element data driven uh, model response is in black and red. And again, you can see that all responses, the experiments, the direct numerical simulation and the data-driven uh, model are essentially coinciding with each other. You're capturing the initial stiffness, you're capturing the peak uh, strength in the material really well, and then you're, you're capturing the post, uh, the post bifurcation, the post shear band uh, response extremely well. But here's my favorite uh, result of all of these. Here is a plot that shows the thickness of the shear band coming from the LSDM, from the discrete uh, direct numerical simulation in blue. And again, it shows you the thickness of the shear band is about 20 particle diameters. Uh, this is at the steady state. So when, you know, way out here uh, at failure. And then we are obtaining the same thickness uh, data-driven micropolar uh, model without having to introduce this length scale. This length scale emanated from the data. We never had to prescribe it. We never had to give it to the model. The model discovers it uh, from the data without having to pursue calibration or anything else. It's discovered naturally in the process. So with that, let me bring this uh, talk to a close uh, so we can entertain some, some questions if there are any. Uh, I've shown you, I hope that uh, I've convinced you that uh, non-locality is a very important feature of granular materials and in paramechanics is key because uh, you have failure surfaces right under the wheel of vehicles, for example. And this issue, this phenomenon is very poorly understood most models completely ignore it, yet it's sort of the elephant in the room. Uh, I've shown you uh, a data-driven approach that complements the physics modeling. It does not replace the physics modeling. It complements it. Uh, using the data, all the data, and nothing but the data. Everything is coming from the data. We didn't need to calibrate anything. The data speaks, and the data tells us you know, what the response is going to be. And I think I've shown you that the data-driven approach is predictive. You can predict things just like in the experiment, just like in the direct numerical simulation. And we are able to capture parameters that people have been looking for for decades, like this length scale, without having to calibrate it, without having to prescribe it. We're able to just discover it from the data and obtain this beautiful uh, shear band thickness uh, that we know from experiments is there and is characteristic of this non-local response. With that, I want to thank you very much for your attention, for being here. And if you're interested in our work, please visit our website and all of our papers are there. And if there's time and interest, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you very, very much, Jose, for your, for your presentation. It was uh, very interesting, and it looks like you're doing really, really a great job with your team. I I went and visited your uh, your website prior to to this uh, this event, and I really I really saw a ton of of interesting stuff over there. So congratulations on 
don't know what you're you're doing and okay i see we already have uh ray here on screen with us so i'll op i'll officially open up the the q a session so ray please hello doctor um if i understand correctly um uh, but it's a cross validation um that you're doing Getting lots of data sets, and you choose the data sets that uh, best match other physical simulations. Um, so it's like cross validating. So that's my first question, if I understand it correctly. And then the second question is um, what parameters do you change of this physics based approach to, um, you know? You, what do you change to generate this uh, these virtual data sets? Do you change the particle size, the, the physics? Um, yeah, what exactly? What yeah. parameters uh, do you change? Yeah, thank you, uh, Ray, for, for those uh, excellent questions. So you are partially right. Uh, we are doing uh, cross-validation in the examples I showed you here. Let me see if I can go back. Uh, to them. Uh, so if you if you can still see my screen, right? Uh, can you still see my screen? Uh, no. Uh, no. It's, uh, it's it's still on screen for me. Okay. Uh, so so this in this one, yes, you're right. We are cross validating with the uh, with the, against the data that we obtain. So in color is the data we obtained right from this from this virtual test that we did in biaxial compression isotropic compression and, and, and simple shear right but we are not taking a pre a pre-obtained path right a pre-obtained path is in color the one we're doing here is in black which cuts across all of these different paths right and then we're comparing that with the direct numerical simulation because we, we have the physics-based model underneath. But, so that's the cross-validation uh, in this case. But in the last example I showed you, in this one, we are going um, beyond. So in this one, right? Can you see it on screen now? Yes, sorry, I think my internet yeah. just so, lagging. So, so here, we're not just comparing the data-driven approach with uh, direct numerical simulation or the physics-based simulation. We're also comparing with experiments here. You know, I'm showing you experimental data here in gray. And if I superimpose the experimental data here for the deformations, it would look just like the one from the from the physics space. They're they're identical. I mean, we've we've shown that. So it would be. Yeah, yeah. So this is the well, true validation phase. Yeah. So so in this one we go beyond uh, just cross validation, right? We we are validating mm. with actual physical experiments, right? Just to make sure that uh, that we are reproducing reality. Uh, now, with respect to your to your other question about the the parameters, or you know. What do we vary in the physics space model? Uh, that's a that's a very good question. And so let's go back to this slide uh, here. Um, so in the physics space model, you have several parameters that you can change. For example, you can change the shape of the grains, right? So if you have all the examples I showed you are for Hastan sand, which is a, a, a very angular sand like the one you see here on the screen. But you could do other sands. You could do Toyura sand. You could do, you know, uh, Santa Barbara sand. Um, and you can introduce their shape, the grain size distribution, and so on uh, in the model directly, right? Because the model can capture any, any particle shape you want. And then, you need to tell them all that. Can, go ahead um i just want to ask can it uh capture pore pressure it's... ah okay so let me let me go there uh in a minute and then you have to tell the model also the mineralogy of the 
of the material. And the way you do that is you prescribe the stiffness, right? You have to tell the, 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 the model how stiff these grains are. So you have a normal stiffness and a shear stiffness. And you also need to prescribe the interparticle friction coefficient. Uh, all of these parameters, the stiffnesses and the interparticle friction coefficient, you can obtain them from grain scale experiments. So you don't have to tune them. You can just give the model what the experiments uh, tell you. And using that, we've obtained the results that I, I showed you in the, in the talk. Uh, so your, your, your parameters are extremely well constrained by the physics, right? You, you, you really don't have a lot of leeway to pick whatever you want. Now, in terms of pore pressures, everything up drain. So the pore pressures in the model are essentially zero. Uh, but uh, people have done things with pressure. For example, my former uh, PhD student, uh, Yuchi Li, uh, did uh, some confining pressures you know, using a membrane. Uh, so here we're, we're confining the sample with a membrane, but it's, it's all drained again. If you wanted to put a fluid in the pore, you would have to introduce, um, you know, the physics of the fluid. You will have to couple, you know, some fluid dynamics with the particle scale method. And we haven't done that yet, but, but it is possible to do, to do it. Some people are working on that. Thank you very much. Uh, that was very informative. Thank you. Okay. Um, I see uh, in the Q&A tab, we have uh, Ezan who has typed uh, several uh, specific questions. So I don't know, uh, Ezan, if you would like to, uh, to join us uh, on stage to ask your questions, or maybe you would do a better job than myself just reading uh, those questions. And uh, at the same time, I also see that uh, uh, Param Soti uh, typed a question uh, on the chat. So if you would like to, uh, to come on stage as well, we, we strongly encourage all our attendees to, to do so, to have more interactive, uh, interactive experience. Okay, I see Ezan uh, coming, uh, should be coming in. Well, maybe I got a glitch. I thought, I thought he was, oh, okay. Uh, okay, wh while, we try we retry that i'll try to read uh to read a different question so uh uh from anonymous uh is the process explained on slide 16 something similar to a genetic algorithm optimization technique so this is slide okay i so guess this what, is slide 16 yeah, yeah. Well, you were mentioning a granular genome, I guess that's what. Uh, um, <laughs> not yet. I mean, not really. Um, you, you, you could use a genetic algorithm, but that's not quite what we're doing here. We, we're simply given, giving a name to this uh, grain scale uh, dynamic network attributes, right? This essentially what we're trying to say here is that there is, there is there is a minimum set of information, right? That's what a genome is. A minimum set of information that encodes all the information you need to know about the material so that you can predict the behavior of the material at the micro scale. And so we, we are saying that if you know the shape or the morphology and the grain size distribution of uh, the particles and you know their mineralogy, that information called that the DNA combined with the state, right? How closely packed these particles are and the pressure and so on. That's all you need in order to predict the behavior at the continuum scale. And you can do that with genetic algorithms. 
otherwise, like we've done it here, we, you can do it with physics-based algorithms. Uh, that that's what we that's what we prefer. Okay, thanks. And so I don't know if Ezan or uh, or uh, Paramsothi would like to well, try. I can, yeah, I can read Jay's uh, question, or Jay, you can ask it yourself. But if you want me, I can I can read it. Uh, so Jay's question is: Will D and E always intersect? If not, what will you attribute it to? No solution, simulation issues, or something else? So this is an ex excellent question. Thank you, Jay, for, for that question. Um, yeah. So the short answer is: E and D don't always intersect, uh, and there is a number of reasons why D and E won't intersect. The main reason is that D, being data, is noisy, right? So you have noise from your data, uh, and so you know it could be experimental error, it can be calculation noise coming from the physics-based model. So what we do is we find the data point D that minimizes the distance to the set E. Um, and if that distance is too far, if the data point D is too far away from the from the equilibrium set E, then what we do is we try to sample, we try to populate data that is closer to E. Um, it is possible, theoretically, that you may not be able to populate data that is close enough to your, uh, to your uh, equilibrium set E, in which case, you, you know, your solution just doesn't converge. Uh, but we haven't we haven't encountered that uh, case. The, the, we haven't found uh, data points missing in areas where you know solutions obey you know the laws of physics. Uh, but in theory, that that could happen, uh, and in which case, like I said, you just don't don't get convergence. But it's kind of weird to have data. You know that doesn't obey the laws of physics. Uh, it, it's just, you know, uh, but it's 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 theoretically possible. Okay. Uh, jumping back to the Q and A uh, to the Q and A tab. Do you want me to go ahead uh, and read the questions for you? Do you want to take them yourself as as it works best for you? So let's see. Um, uh, well, I think the other, the only other question that we couldn't ask is the one from Hassan, right? He was asking, is there a chance to ask questions? The answer is yes. Uh, so Hassan, can you either unmute know, and ask your question? Like so, oh. so, sorry, Jose, you should switch to the Q&A tab. You're probably still watching oh, oh. the, the chat. Is that, uh, oh, is it not is it not visible for for the speaker my, my, my bad uh, i'm sorry no I, I see it now i'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, okay okay uh, no, no problem i was just in the wrong tab okay so lots of questions here okay um so i mean uh, uh is asking are these developed based on the steady state momentum equation what are the routines of the lsdm and the data driven methods for a case with millions of particles Okay, so everything I've shown you today is based on quasi-static, uh, you know, the formation. But but you can do dynamics. The the LSDM and the finite element solution work extremely well for dynamics. But everything I showed you was quasi-static. Okay, uh, time is not really time; it's pseudo time, uh, and there are no rate effects. Uh, uh, what are the routines of the LSDM? So LSDM is essentially a, a discrete element method. It's solving force equals MA, you know, Newton's uh, equation. And then, you know, it's doing contact mechanics to resolve the forces and then, you know, also the moments. Um, and in the data-driven methods for a case with millions of particles, yeah, so you can do millions of particles. There's no problem. Um, of course, the, the only uh, constraint you have is computational power. Uh, so the more particles you have in a system, the longer it takes for the 
for the physics-based models to run, right? So we've done hundreds of thousands of particles. We've never done millions of particles. But again, in theory, this is, this is very well possible. Okay, then a uh, question from Hassan. In each integration point of the macro level, you put some info about the micro level and the strain and stress and the strain and strain and stress, I'm, I'm guessing it, it means. And then you will have the stress. Where is the equilibrium line? Okay, so very good question. So, Hassan, yes, in, the, in each integration point, uh, we, uh, we don't necessarily input the strain. Uh, we, what we do is in each integration point, Again, we, we're trying to find the data point in the data that uh, is corresponding to the equilibrium set. Uh, and so we, 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 you're thinking a bit like the fem dem approaches where you would go in with, an, with a strain and then come back with a stress. Uh, Data-driven is not exactly that. What, what you're doing is that each integration point you are finding the either the intersection or the minimum distance uh, to the data uh, points, and so it's it's similar but not exactly the same. Um, did you use Lie algebra and orthogonal decomposition um, on your data set uh, stress and strain? Uh, no, we. Um, we, we are, again, we're, we're just using, this is embryonic at this point, so we're just using the, the straight data, but you, you could, you could these approaches, uh, here we're just showing you examples, you, the full, you know, six dimensional stress and, and, and strain uh, data sets. Uh, but again, people are working on these areas and trying to, uh, for instance, minimize the data or reduce the data to invariance and, and things like that, uh, just to reduce those data sets. Um, okay, Ray already asked this question. Another question from Hassan. Uh, what type of network did you use? We're not using networks. No, 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 no uh, neural networks in this work. Um, all of the data that we got was from the physics space and uh, that's how we populated the, the data set. So, no, no networks uh, whatsoever. Um, but you could, again, you could use uh, machine learning, for example, to interpolate data. Uh, that's what machine learning does really well. Um, to generate a data, you consider three types of loading. Do you think you can capture all the hardening behavior via those loads? Do you think your data generate, generated is unbiased? This is a very good question. Um, we, we, we didn't just do three uh, types of loading. The, the three types of loading I showed you was for the very particular example of the local model. When I did the, the triaxial sample, we're doing very wild, very different uh, stress paths in each Gauss point, right? And so each one of those Gauss points is equipped with a micromechanical model that is being run to populate the data. Uh, you could have pre-run pre uh, virtual tests, say in a library, and then you could use that data um, during a, a final element calculation. Of course, you know, if that's all you have, then that's the data you have. When you're doing data-driven, you need data. So if, if you have a sparse data set uh, in a, Phase space that you're probing, then you're limited by the amount of data you have, and so uh, you are going to do some bias uh, if you don't populate more densely uh, your data set. So uh, we, what we do is then, if we are in a sparse area, we just populate more data with with the virtual experiments that we have at our disposal. But again, people are thinking of other ways to populate uh, data sets that, that doesn't require running uh, physics-based methods. So, but that's a, that's a very good question. Um, okay, we've answered uh, the one on, on uh, slide 16. Um, yeah. that, that's it, huh? Yeah, that's it. 
Uh, thanks, Jose, for being both the host and the guest for this Q&A. <laughs> Very kind of you. And, uh, well, I think we have still a couple, a couple minutes if there's somebody else that would, would like to, uh, to jump, to jump uh, on screen with us or, or type uh, a last, last minute questions. I'll, let's see if we have, wait a few seconds to see if we have some, some takers here. Okay, it looks, it looks like everyone is satisfied. Well, and I think we, we really had a, a very uh, interesting presentation and, and a very, oh yeah, uh, a, last, a last second question. So is the data-driven method real time? Right. Yes. So the answer is yes. That's how we are. That's how we are doing it. Uh, so we're populating data in real time on the fly. But as I said earlier, you don't have to do that. You can you can have pre-cooked data, uh, like in the local uh, example I showed you, right, where you have your data already pre-computed, pre-assembled uh, for you, and then use that. Uh, but in the finite element uh, experiment that I showed you with the shear band, there you we're doing it in real time. Um, so you can pick, um, you know, what you want. I, I think that the, the best approach is one where you have a library of pre-computed data uh, or pre-measured data, and you try to use that first. And again, if that if that uh, intersects your your, then you use that. But if you have sparsity and you need more, you, you know, you run some quick virtual tests as you need, and then you, you populate uh, the data uh, with that. So uh, I think that in the future, that's how people are going to be doing uh, data-driven uh, calculations, you know, with pre-cooked data uh, first, and if that's not available, then they're going to cook the data on the spot. Okay. I guess we are ready to to wrap up now, and so let me put uh, my sl uh, closing slide uh, uh, on screen. And uh, thanks again, Jose, for taking the time to be to be with us uh, today and to be our speaker in our digital event series. It was really a pleasure and uh, and a honor to uh, to have you today with us. And um, and I would like to extend my thank you to also to all uh, your staff uh, that uh, worked with with ISTVS to to make this possible. So uh, thank you, thank you all very much for yeah for the invitation. It was really a pleasure for me to be here, and uh, all the best. And we hope our paths will uh, will cross again uh, soon. And uh, uh, I wish you. Uh, all the best uh, as well for for all your your great endeavors and and your amazing research. Thank Thanks, you, uh, uh, Massimo. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm sure our paths will cross again. Yeah, take care. Take care. And yeah, and before before I I end I end the stream, uh, I would like to thank also uh, all the amazing staff here at ISTVS that is contributing to make these events possible. And of course, every one of you in attendance uh, today. I would also like to invite uh, all graduate students and research professionals out there to, uh, to join us in this initiative and consider being uh, our next speakers, both for, for the student research seminars and the Terra Mechanics Bytes. And you can find all the relevant details uh, at the website uh, that you see here, uh, here on screen. And finally, another important item, the ISTVS 2022 membership uh, campaign is starting soon. And whether you are already a member or uh, or not so whether 
you are one of those that are expected to be renewing their uh, their membership or that we expect to be joining the society, uh, you can find uh, the relevant um, links here uh, on the slide. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, the The first announcements will be uh, will be coming soon for for the campaign. So yeah, now that's really it. So uh, thanks again, everyone, uh, for joining us today, and see you at the next event. Uh, goodbye, everyone. <laughs>